Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and welcome to the podcast, and we call this Wealth Without Risk. The real title is Imagine Wealth Without Risk, and I know why you're here. You're here because you want to learn how to make money, and my guest today is Doug and Elma, and this is this is really going to be special because they started out just a short time ago and they were successful right away. And that's what you want to be. And everybody isn't successful right away because they don't concentrate and they don't have the time. I'm going to get into this um, webinar and seminar and podcast all at the same time. And I'm going to ask a few questions to get them started. But if you're driving in your car, that's good, but you'll want to go back and and do the replay and look at the show notes later because Linda will put little notes in the show notes for you and some reminders. But Doug and Elmira, am I saying it right? Am I saying your name right? Elma. Elma, right? Elma? Yeah. Let me write it down. If I goof it up, just correct me. I'm not embarrassed when I make a mistake. I just make a mistake. I keep going, but I get a lot done. So getting a lot done is more important than being perfect. Let's start out with the question for both of you. Just tell me a little bit about yourself so the audience can relate to you and and know who you are. Give us an age range. I I doubt if you're millennials, but if you're a millennial, tell us that. A little bit about ages, a little bit about uh, what you do, how many kids you had, how many marriages you had, whatever you want to talk about. So just tell us about yourself. Great. This is Doug, and we're a pair, partners in business and in life. I'm in my 50s. Alma's in her 40s, and we're both in California. And Alma is in pharmaceutical sales and she's rocking and rolling and she's a very successful gal and I am a ex-techie and I've been doing real estate investing for the past couple of years full time. Wow, good for you. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I've been in pharmaceutical sales for 19 years and I've also done some real estate on the side on my weekends and nights. And there's been a lot of Home Depot runs at 6 a.m. and Home Depot runs. <laughs> yeah. Home Depot runs. Oh, so you, yeah. yeah, Home Depot <laughs> runs. Oh, I know are. Home Depot like the back of my hand. Oh, so my God. That's a dangerous store for Alma, right, baby? Yeah. <laughs> we will run right past if we can. And, uh, and I actually have a pilot's license because I started my career in aerospace. And uh, it helps when you have a lot of houses to look at across the state. It helps to have a little plane. You can get wow. faster. Wow. Yep. And, and what airport do you fly from? Uh, I fly from the Bay Area, multiple yeah. airports, and all, right. all over the state. And right. there's an auction, whether we're going to take the big bird, the car, or the little bird. Or whether we're going to split up. <laughs> uh, yeah, we uh-huh. Oh, wonderful. Tag team and and uh, Alma will drive a county and then Doug will drive a county in the same time zone and same timeline. Yep. That's really interesting. I don't know, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I'll tell the audience because they, they wouldn't know it. But my first career was a pilot and the uh, first business I started after I left the airlines was in a place called Concord, California. And which is on the north end of the bay. And that business is still there. I sold it back in 1972 and went into the real estate business. And I was a flight examiner for many years. And I licensed hundreds of private pilots, commercial pilots, instrument pilots, and multi-engine pilots. So, Wow, so you were hardcore, Ted. Yes. I was the youngest flight examiner in the United States when I was 24 years old. How about wow. that? Wow. That's yeah. amazing. I That's can't amazing. even remember that far back, but it says it on this ticket I've got that I was young then. I was <laughs> a long time ago. And, and of course, those days we had those leather helmets we put on and things like that. Wow. I'm joking, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I know the truth, Tim. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, wow. I thought that was the 20s. <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah. I, qualified, I qualified in Learjets in 1972. Wow. 1972. So was that a long time ago? That's yeah, amazing. when you go up and practice, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, you, oh, my uh, gosh. Yeah. That's a dream. I have a Centurion 210, if you know what that is. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
Nice, nice. Nice yeah. airplane. Nice, yeah. fast, moves quickly, yeah. gets uh, three miles yeah. a minute. What's wrong with that? That's pretty good, there right? You go. exactly. Yeah. What's wrong with three miles a minute? Yeah. Nice and easy to yeah. estimate when you're flying instruments. Yeah, I'll be there and yeah. divide it by three, right? Uh, I love there it. You okay. go. All right. I have well, my first rental in Concord as well. You say that again in Concord? I, yeah, in Concord, that was my first rental. Oh my goodness, good for you. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Small world. <laughs> it is a small world. And what company did you rent it from? No, I what I bought the house. Oh, you bought your first rental. Oh, yeah. I was thinking of an airplane rental, but you're thinking about a home oh. rental. Okay. A home? Yeah, no. Okay. Well, well, that's, what, that's what we're supposed to be talking about. We're supposed to be talking about real estate, aren't we? So <laughs> we better switch over again. See, pilots, they're all hangar flying all oh, the time. Yeah, yeah we, you guys do we, that. We, we fell right back into the mode, didn't we? That's what pilots do. They talk about yeah. all their experiences. So great. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, real estate because you had a little background in that. And uh, we know each other because you, somewhere along the line, started learning about tax lien certificates and tax deeds. But the more important thing, which is what my broadcast is about, I say making money and being independent and learning how to be financially free. And it sounds to me like if you guys are at the point where you already own a, a Cessna 210, you're doing pretty darn good. So you've figured this money thing out. So let's try to convey some of that to our listeners because a couple like yourselves have a lot of information that's very good. So we're going to stop talking about Ted and all that flying stuff. And we're going to talk about making money. I understand your background and I'd like to know more about it, but we've only got an hour on the pod. So let's, let's go back to t- uh, talking about tax lien certificates and tax deeds. Give us a little hint to the two of you, how you started and even why you started doing it. Yeah, started because it was a very interesting business from the standpoint of very quick cash and with some limited investment. And so we've been investing in real estate for some time. And depending on how you invest, there's pros and cons. And one of the biggest cons is when you own real estate and you're going to sell it down the road, it's an asset that's just sitting there and the money's tied up in the property. If you're doing tax liens and tax deeds, you can invest, you can buy the property and you could resell it pretty quickly. And instead of a buy and hold strategy, you can do this quick turn in terms of cash. And then when the real estate cycles go up and down as they normally do, it's a great way just to stay in the game the whole time because you're always in and out. You're never putting yourself out there and and letting yourself hang out there in terms of the equity and the the money. So that's what attracted us to tax deeds and tax liens. And we got pretty excited about it after your workshop and we went full bore in and attended a bunch of online auctions and came up with a couple properties. Wow. Oh, Joy, we're going to talk a lot about that. Okay. This broadcast is all about actually trying to work with less investments and making more money in a safe, secure atmosphere, if at all possible. And it sounds like you've done some other things in real estate too. So what other things did you do prior to coming? Because it'll be fun for us to compare the two and I'll let you do that. You did other real estate before you came into the tax lien and deed part of the business. So what did, uh, I'm just suspect because I heard about those trips to Home Depot and that's the trips I tell people not to make. So I love it. Uh, what, did, what, what did you guys do, fixer uppers or something like that? Yeah, that was me. So I decided because pharmaceuticals is, it's a great job. It's um, very nice, but the companies decide that one day in the morning, they tell us all stay home and half of the sales force is laid off. And that's typical of pharmaceutical companies. And so I just needed something more stable, something that I felt I had more control over my life. And so I started doing, having rentals. And so I bought a house, fixed it up, and then put a a renter in there. And I figured that would be the way to get me out of the rat race. I was like, oh no, it's gonna take 20 of these, right? Uh, it was It was not late night. <laughs> oh no, I'm gonna run out of money. I did run out of money, right? Oh, I believe it, I believe it. Yeah, I bought a few and I, they were all here in California. And I said, okay, so I'm out of money. I have these rentals, I have tenants, toilets and tenants, right? I did all that, I managed them myself. I didn't have anyone else managing it for me. I just, I, I like control. 
but that meant I got the calls and so on the weekends and whatever. Right. And so then I said, okay, well, I'm out of money. So what do I do? So the next thing was do some flips. <laughs> oh my goodness. The flipping business. And I flipped properties here in California, did really well. But once again, I was doing all the managing. And so I was managing the crews. I was doing all that. And I'm a pharmaceutical sales rep. So sometimes I would go to the house and I'm in heels. <laughs> so oh, my goodness. To oh. bring uh, sandals and to bring tennis shoes and always have those in the car. Yeah. Sometimes I needed to go up on the roof and I was in heels. So that didn't quite, oh. that didn't quite work very well. So I learned that. And then... Because I was the managing the project manager, the contractors needed things. And so I needed to go to Home Depot. And so they would send me the list. And then I would, of course, I still had my job. So at 6 a.m., Home Depot opens at 6 a.m., I was there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah, I was wow. there buying and the products so that the crew could have the material for the following day. Plus, you were putting up all the money to pay Home Depot, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. I learned how to open up a business account to for from them, but like the I didn't like the wood. Like when they choose the wood, Home Depot, like they, they can just give you whatever. So I'm very picky as you can tell. And so I would go choose the wood myself. I would go through I was just too much involved. And so that burned me out after a few of those. <laughs> I was like, this is this is another full-time job. So. I'm happy to hear you laughing because most people come out. If I, if I say this to you, you'll agree more than like it. Most people come out of these fixer-uppers crying. They don't come out laughing. Yeah. yeah, I did really monetarily. So it was worth the investment. It was worth my time. It was worth, it was just having two jobs. So I didn't realize that because the TV doesn't show that. TV yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Buy it. You quickly sell it. And it's gorgeous when you sell it, and then you just run to the bank. Or, exactly, or a, right? They don't tell you all the hiccups. The city, at one point, one of the houses, I took it down to the studs and turned it from a two-bedroom, one-bath to a three-bedroom, two-baths, just because I wouldn't Whoa. that way. So I did that, but that meant a lot of permits. And since I was running the project, that meant me spending a lot of time with the city. <laughs> I learned all about the city and how that whole process works. And that was very interesting. And then so you, you and learned that you do all the work and the city does all the sitting. Yeah, exactly. And they come and then one, they tell you to do one thing and then they, they come back again and then they say, oh no, do it back like the original way you had it. And so you're like, you just made me waste time and energy and money. Is so, the, so then I learned that you ask for the same in, in, uh, inspector all the time right yeah all yeah. the time so then they don't have different people telling you different things let me and, ask you two questions okay would you ever take a house down to the studs again you still there or did i lose you <laughs> or did you fall out of your chair are you there <laughs> are you okay <laughs> or did you swear at me and then i didn't get it you said something bad okay no you didn't <laughs> I, i'm joking yeah. with you I'm, I'm there's joking. silence um yeah, yeah. It would have to really, really work it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, good. That's a good. Point. I would probably have a project manager. Just, just, just describe to the audience because it, it wasn't what I, I wanted to talk about, but it makes my point. My point is always to the client: buy it low, sell it low, make a profit, get out, and do that as many times as you can. You might not make as much money as you thought, but you'll always make money. There's a big chance that when you buy a property and have to do what you did. Now, you're a woman of means and Doug is a man of means and you guys can weather the storm. I mean, if your Home Depot bill went to 10,000 or 15 or 20,000, you could handle it. But the average person can't handle that plus take care of their family plus unless they have means. In other words, if they've got a big savings account and all that, you're not going in the investment business to be in, in the savings business, you're going in it to make money. So tell the audience, how tied up you could get financially in one of these deals. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's big, isn't it? Oh my God. I mean, is it 10,000? 10,000? No. In one of the houses, I put in $110,000. Oh my God. That's the one that I took it down to the studs. And you could have lost your assets. Is that true? 
<laughs> yeah, had the market changed during that time, I could have. But thank goodness the market didn't change during that time. Okay. All right. So that's the point I try to make to people. And you're an honorable person uh, we've met because you've been in my class. But, you know, uh, if we can convey that to more people, we're actually doing the market a favor. I'm not saying my competition is bad. I'm saying forget that. Buy and quickly sell. Don't get bogged down. So we, we won't discuss the time, but I'm going to guess that took you six or nine months to do all that. Plus, it took up all your time which yes, you made a profit, but I don't think you made a profit as high as you thought you were gonna make. Whereas it much, in my opinion, it's better to buy and then quickly sell, buying. I'm not afraid of fixer uppers, but you have to have significant funds to do that. So do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, actually that's why we got really attracted to your program because of your strategy. Because yeah. I had never, I had looked into tax deeds because obviously I was looking at the flipping business side of it and it just didn't make sense. I didn't quite understand it. I think I was too young in the business to quite understand it. I just didn't take the time. Maybe that's probably what it was to understand it. But when you were on the webinar and I was listening to you say buy low, sell low, it was like, I just was hearing some golden words. And that's really what attracted us to your program because it made sense that you would go in, get out fairly quickly and not have to do all the work, 6 a.m., Home Depot, 10 p.m., Home Depot, right? And everything else along with that. Yeah, and you were lucky at a Home Depot. Some people have to get a Home Depot 25 miles away and other people have that. There's a Home Depot 25 miles in the north and the Lowe's is 25 to the south. And so these trips take uh, half half a day every time just to get the smallest thing for the property. And and then all the workmen are sitting there waiting for you when you get back. And you have to pay them too while uh, all this is going on and you have to pay Home Depot. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. None of that's easy. Wow. Mm. Okay, we that's talked good. about the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, go, jump in and to, jump in. Jump right in. No, I wanted to finish your question on what other real estate you do. And I invested in single families as where most investors start. Then I moved to multifamily and bought an apartment complex. And what you get, of course, is a passive income, which is great, but you basically quickly run out of money because you can't, you have to be very wealthy to just keep buying apartment complexes. And so you might diversify and say, okay, I'm going to invest some money there, which I did. And then you run against a wall and okay, what do you do? We have some means, as you mentioned, enough to get into the tax key business quick and buy the properties and quickly sell them and just keep growing. What's attractive is, can you imagine buying an apartment complex or even a house in California? Even flippers are, are pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. And some of the auction starting bids, of course, are very low, but ultimately a lot of them is be overpriced uh, by the other bidders, but the ones that aren't, you can get a pretty good deal for them without a lot of cash outlay and you can quickly turn it. That's the beauty of the model, Ted, your model is that you can start very modestly and grow it based on level of effort and the knowledge. Yes. It's a different world and it's more of an investor's world than the, the fixer upper world. The fixer upper world, I think everyone learned that from their uncle or their grandfather or somebody to paint it, clean it, put a little white picket fence and it's ready to go. But as she just stated, some of these houses are going to take a lot more than a, a paint cleanup and white picket fence. Uh, some of them take their challenges in themselves to get things in order and the workmen are sometimes a challenge to get them in place. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the less you can have to do, the less risk there is. And right. Like, and when and, you get in and out quickly, there's basically less risk because there's less that you're yes. I think working less helps you more because you have time to think. And the thinking and the strategy are what are important with the tax liens and deeds. So thinking about the one property that you want might entail looking at four or five properties to get one that's real close to what you want, uh, but your strategies and, and what you're going to do with it are going to make all the difference in the world because what if you can do two or three over the next 18 months as against 
whew, just getting through one and finally getting some money back in the bank. Just the fact that you get money back in the bank, let's just start sleeping at night and relaxing a little bit and you're not worried about every little payment. When you're doing fixer uppers, they can easily consume all your money. But you started to talk about apartments. So why don't we kind of transition because I'm very fortunate to have the two of you here today because now Elma's sharing what she's sharing, which if I say those things, people hear me, but they don't resent me saying it or anything like that. But to hear someone that's been in the trenches like she has, whether she had her high heels on or her tennis shoes, it's not, it's not the best job for anybody to have to do, especially if they have money pressure or they have work pressure. But now you've transitioned and you've gone into that a similar business, but at a much higher level. But again, it can be, a, it can be a, to use a vernacular, is money suck. It can really use a lot of money quickly. And then that can put you back in that same situation where it's, if you're used to having a little bit of money, it's very difficult when you don't have some because you don't feel comfortable again. So maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, that's very true. If you wanted to hear from a Doug, it's a very different feeling to have that cushion and not have the cushion or the money as a cushion, but you know that due to the risk of your portfolio or what's out there, it can be snagged at any time because it needs to be. I have an interesting story where back in the market's turn, 2008, I was still in the single family business and I bought a house at a foreclosure auction. Its top retail price a number of years before that was 410,000. I bought it at the auction at 286,000 and was going to flip it quickly, try and flip it quickly and get out. I happened to buy it right when the market was tanking at its most uh, accelerated rate. By the time I fixed it and was selling it for 335, 350, the market already went past that. 330, 300, 250. Oh no. So I held it as a rental, uh-huh. came out fine at the end because I had the cushion. I had the financing that made it work good with just having a renter in there, but that wasn't my original plan. And so I had to hold that thing for years. Uh, wow. Years, and then it came back above what I bought it for and what I put into it. And then I sold it. You think you're flipping and depending on what the market does, you're exposed. That was a valuable lesson. I was lucky. A lot of people weren't. And I just kissed the ground I walked on that I was fortunate enough to be able to hold on to. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing. You hunt. Oh, you know, one thing, Ted, it went all the way down to 157. Yeah, that town will, that town got really hit. The where it the was, town that uh, he, he bought it at. It was in it was in Tracy, California, near Stockton. So that yeah, yeah I know Tracy. Yeah, I, know Tra- so I used to really I used to hire mechanics to work for me from the Duval Institution over there. Yeah, oh, yeah. there you yep. go. That's a, a story for the grandkids who want to get into flipping someday. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. So, so let, let me ask you a question just to clarify for the audience. You're telling me that you bought at an auction for yes. 285 and your 285 investment dropped all the way to 130. Is that correct? 150. Oh, 150. 157 eventually. So by when I bought it, it was moving from probably 380 and because the market was already going down. And so it was worth 410, and then it was 380 by the time I bought it at the auction. And no one knew it was going to tank that far, right? Of course not. Just went down aggressively, yeah. and I was chasing it all the way oh, down. And you you it's like you, you buy a stock and you see it go, down. See it go down, <laughs> and you hold it, and you hope it comes back. And you don't want to do that with real estate. <laughs> oh, no. And so what was your feeling in your stomach, in the back of your mind, and what did it do to your self-esteem? I took three steps back and I looked at it. I go, that wasn't my plan. So that is a upsetting feeling because you wanted to use the money for some other reasons. Now you can't, it's stuck in the property. You question your decision-making, you question your strategy, you learn, you say, okay, maybe this isn't the right business at this time. 
Maybe it's not the right business ever. <laughs> yeah, very good. The sort of thing well, you run through, right? I love to hear the two of you laughing because a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people, are, a lot of people don't recover from this. They do. Well, we've had successes too, but it's much more interesting to talk about the the other yeah. side of the coin. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. love when people talk about what doesn't go right. I learn yeah. more. <laughs> All right, give us the big lesson, and then. The two of you take me through this transition. You made the transition and now you've completely done the opposite. But what was the big lesson for both of you? Alma, go first. Give me one quick, very important lesson that you want any, every listener to know. Slips take a lot of time, energy, money, and a lot of skills to manage people, which you don't, don't realize that when you're looking at the shows. And yes, money's there if you buy right and you, you know what you're doing. You know, I actually tell people, and I have a friend taught me to do this. He said, tell people to stop watching those fixer-upper shows. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any truth to that? Yes, absolutely, because they, don't, they only show you the beginning and they show you the end. They don't show you everything that's in the middle. And my understanding now with all those flipping businesses, some of these are actually uh, losing money, but they're not letting us know that. Exactly. And I get lots of them in my seminars now. I said, what are you doing here? So the fix, they tell me the fixer upper business is dead. Who knows when people are going to hear this recording, but, and Doug, what's the big lesson that you had? And then I really want to get into this uh, because the audience uh, is listening and I actually titled this program Wealth Without Risk, but you're kind enough to share your story with us, which is, I'd love to have the two of you at a seminar sharing, but maybe one day you'll find time to be able to come and see us and tell this in the seminar environment because people really need this lesson. I come from a background very similar, but I tell my story, but somehow it has very little feeling when you're talking, when the guy in the front is talking about it, but when people like yourself come and say, look, we turned it all around, but we did it with our own skill, and, which is exactly what you did. Now, I'm an educator. I like to say we help contribute, but that's all we do is a contribution. It takes the two of you, but enough about me and let's get back to Doug. Doug, tell us a, a big lesson that you learned from that crisis, and then let's go to the positive part of all this. Yeah, so the lesson learned is real estate is a great investment but you need to manage the risk. It's much better to get into a situation that has low risk and deal with the return being lower, it's fine. If you go for the higher risk, higher reward, that might work, you might get lucky, but then it can really come crashing down hard on you. And anyone who's been in the real estate business for any length of time probably has a similar story. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. That's good. And so the two of you came, two of you studied, and then you are at a three-day event, and then you went back to California. I know you'll be cautious, but I don't want you to tell us what city or towns you're, or auctions you're going to, because it's none of the audience's business to know that. But what they would like to know is they would like to know what it was like at an auction. They would like to know, are you going to make a profit? They would like to know, is this, is this difficult? Is it, and you, you don't have to pull any punches. Is it easy? What is it? Um, Ted uh, paints a nice picture of how, how great it is, but how close is the picture to what really happens? Because late night television for, for I know for 30 years has been showing everybody getting rich by Friday afternoon on fixer upper houses. And I certainly know better. And we got Elmar here to guide us to make sure we don't do that again. <laughs> Yeah. After the workshop, Ted, and thank you for your time and putting that together. You're welcome. Um, we got on the ball, and in uh, California, a lot of the auctions are online. They might all be, I don't know, but we actually participated uh, in, believe it or not, eight online auctions, which wow. had us traveling quite a bit, as you can imagine, because it, and I hope your students listen to this, it is important to actually go see the property <laughs> and <Yes. laughs> else look at it if you trust them. But we had in almost every auction, in every case, the picture was not what was there. And it's either the house was either burned down or actually not there. And a lot, uh, a, a lot actually had a structure on it. And it's amazing when you walk around these properties, 
how they can be different. Now I have to say the five percent of them are what you think they are, at least pictorially, but there's that five percent that you think if if you're gonna get lazy and start bidding on it, guess what? It might not be what you think. It's interesting because when you first start getting involved and driving around and looking at these properties, the big lesson that we had was no, this is not a flip business. It's not a buy and hold business. You're not looking for beauty. You're looking for a quick turnaround. You're looking to invest and sell to other investors primarily. And you need to have that kind of an eye when you look at this. Thing. So, the one thing I wanted to share with people is get comfortable and more used to looking at properties that aren't necessarily what you would live in, mm -hmm. but that investors would buy and fix and sell or do whatever they want with it. We came across all those auctions. And at the end of the day, after many miles, we picked up two properties. And if you're ready, I'm, I'm happy to tell you about those. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Were they both at the same uh, auction or at different auctions? No, they're at different auctions, but guess what? They were happening at the same time. So, oh, so the team effort took place yeah. here. Yeah, and oh. that's where we, uh, we divided and conquered. Very good. That's, uh, it's nice to have someone you can trust, right? Yeah, yeah. So we oh, my goodness. Good up and did that oh. thing, and uh, we bought them. And uh, it was quite fun to uh, pick up one, and then a few hours later, pick up another one, actually a couple hours later. <laughs> the, the cell phone was on fire. Yeah, and it was interesting because I can't tell you how many properties we looked at, you can imagine. And uh, like 200 uh, probably. And oh, probably more than that. And then, really? but the lesson there is, the lesson there is just like in Alma can tell you in sales, you put in a lot of effort, but if you put in the effort and the time, statistically, it will happen. Yeah. If you oh. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought if I bought the course on Sunday to buy Friday, I'd be all done. Now, you're going to tell me there's some skill required here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. They didn't, oh, say yeah. that the, yeah. they didn't say that in the course material. I didn't see any of that on television. And uh, it's helpful to, if you want to go, whether in person or online, and if, if you don't think you're going to get anything, just join it anyway, just to get a feel for it quite a different feeling putting in hard-earned money in a bid it's a very exciting thing mm -hmm. and I know Ted that you've told people the same and kind of get over yourself because it's gonna you have to get over and it's interesting because as I told you about the foreclosure auction I went to back in 2008 and here I am 10 years 11 years later and going, wow, it feels the same. Yeah, exactly. Your, <laughs> knees is, your knees are shaking when you're spending your own money. Yeah, you're right. It's, all, it's not the seminar anymore. No, yeah. but it's fun. I'm sure people get you know, addicted. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're looking at all the auctions, and we picked up two. And Okay, let's talk about those two. Who wants to go first? Uh, you both bought them. I didn't, I'm getting a double team here. My audience is really getting a lot today. Two of you bought. I, I got one call. This is great. Uh, yeah, wonderful. we. The, both so of us bought I, yeah, the I two. Still, yeah, I still have a job. So Doug is the one that's in charge of being in front of the computer and bidding. And just get the text message. We got it. <laughs> <I'll be laughs> Going out there with doctors. <laughs> okay, so can I say you're the the high heel auction auction buyer or what do we call you or, or were you or were you in your or you, were you in your pajamas tell me which <laughs> oh alma was out there all pretty dressed up being <laughs> farmer rep i'm okay. in my workout gear oh ish kind of gear right yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so that's you how the, did that you were the engineer on vacation and she was still the proper woman that we know her to be that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, good. All right. And so we had, we had max limits and we had talked about all the properties that potentially we could get. Yeah. And so we had maximum bids on all of them too. So yeah. Doug would get frustrated when our maximum bids would get jumped, right? And then we would look at what it ended up selling. And, you or, could, and California is a different market. There's price. a price. Over overbidding it, but there's a couple needles in the haystack that you can get yeah and, uh, did, you, did you have some profanity when the bidding went too high 
<laughs> you know, there's one. I'm that, getting close to home here. I won't ask any more tough questions. Well, what's funny is that's human nature, right? So you can yes. only attach to a few of them. Oh, that would be great. Bye. And then, <laughs> and you're bidding down to the last five minutes. And even if this works, you think you might have it. And then somebody just throws in the sledgehammer and the bidding just starts going crazy and you're like okay that one's gone turn the page yeah. and yeah uh, that's that's the reality. I, I, until the sledgehammer comes down on your thumb you really can't <laughs> appreciate it but when it hits, <laughs> and it hits your thumb which you are about to go five thousand more or 250 more <laughs> you said oh my god what happened well that that's why your max bid strategy is important because oh, you wow. can get emotionally caught up Every time you go over it, you're yourself. Every time. Yeah. It's never, so we, never. We, we, as Alma said, we set our maximum prices on the ones we we're interested in. Good. And um, the first one was actually, it's a, it's a great shell. It's a two-story, five-bedroom, one-and-a-half bath. It's an older place. It's interesting. It's stucco on the outside. It looks very cool. Yeah. It's the jelly bean shape. It's really interesting. And the rooms have curved walls in it. And it's really unique, unique. catching thing. The castle. It, it, I call it the castle. But so that one, all aftermarket value again, after repair value. Yeah. Somebody really put some TLC into that thing would go probably for around 200000 about oh, 200,000. And you buy, did you buy the neighborhood or did you buy the house? <laughs> that, and that's on a nice street. Picked it up for 61. So. Oh my goodness, 61. So a third of the value, less than third. Third of the value. Oh, and in California, that's like, a, that's like a big hit. Yeah, you know how it is in California, right? So. Uh, 50. 50% uh, is a pretty good deal in California, don't you? And think? of course, we thought we picked it up because. Uh, it didn't show well at, on a picture. It was completely overgrown with you trees couldn't see and it you at couldn't all. really see it well. And so most people probably just passed it by. And uh, so, so uh, let's make a point there. I think I think what you're saying is the auction buyers online will bid higher than in, per in person. I think that's probably true. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, you have people from all over the. The country world. in the world, looking at a Google picture and right. bid it without seeing it, and in California, because that's where people think they want to buy. Right. The, they see a picture like that and they go, "Oh no, I'm just going to pass that." Mm -hmm. and, and overgrown just, bushes, oh trees, you couldn't really see it at all. And when Alma was the lucky person to go see that one, when we were tag teaming. And she took some pictures of what it really looked like. And I immediately got excited about it. I think I was more excited than Alma for sure about it. I talked to the neighbors, <laughs> tried to get some information from them. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, they the, like the that. Place, they like to talk. They always like to talk. Yeah, yeah the yeah. place looked uh, really great in terms of potential. And then actually had it cleaned up. Oh, yeah. Uh, took, took all the vegetation out to actually... The, and, and the neighbors could see it now. They couldn't see it before, and they would come out and go, wow, look at this place. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Someone's taking and care of it. The damn neighbors didn't even know what it looked like. So. <laughs> Unbelievable, huh? So what, and, will you uh, sell, what will you sell it for? Oh, so this is a strategy, Ted. We're, we're, we're waiting for the tax deed on this one, but we're just going to sell it as is. We're going to put out the ugly signs and get it out there and... Probably do a round robin if you are uh, familiar. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know you. Yeah. And the reason is we had quickly put up a sign <laughs> and, and took it back down. We, uh, le we learned the hard way. <laughs> no, this is a good story. We, we were going to just turn it right away, but we wanted to get, we're new at this. And so we wanted to get a hold of the tax deed first without assigning it and, and doing all that. But before we decided that, we. Alma put out a sign that said for sale, and it wasn't you know, the big ugly, it was just a sign. And it's, the house on the back side is right next to a highway. Sure enough, 
this trucker comes in, he goes, I want it, I want it. <laughs> My God, this is great. <laughs> and, and we said, it's a shell. There's nothing in here. Nice hardwood floors are in there, but that's about it. Oh, this is it. And so we took his name and number and all that good stuff. And when we get the tax deed, we'll make sure he knows. That. But it's just uh, a great place in terms of traffic. Everyone driving by is going to see that ugly sign on that highway. So. so did you decide not to sell it to them for any we're, reason? We're going we're gonna to wait for the tax deed to come, like which month, is... Three weeks, maybe? Yeah, it's a month from now or so. And then we'll put up the signs. And that way we'll have it. And we're doing the tax title services on this one just because we're starting. Out, so it'll have title. So uh, okay. get it out there. Now, I'm already feeling, Ted, that's overkill. But we're going to do it on this one. Yeah, that's okay. Um, you're comfortable with that. But just so you know, you can sell it based on getting the complete deed. So you okay. could, if he was a willing buyer at that point, take a deposit, write it right on the contract that you're waiting for the deed so that they, yes. you know, full disclosure. Yes. And then then you get it sold. But when you put the sign up this time, of course, it'll be all cleaned up. You're going to get multiple buyers. So you, because anything that, in the two hundred thousand dollar range in California is going to be like, oh my God, this is you're the Costco of that town. You're yeah, we think just by cleaning it up, we probably got another twenty, thirty k. Just <laughs> another thirty k. Okay, so what well, do you I think? Mean, what's your net? Yeah. What, what's your net on this sixty thousand dollar investment? You're going to get your sixty back plus how much? We we want the round robin to define that. To be honest with you, but we're thinking hundred mm -hmm. would be fine. Okay, that's great. What's that? What's that about 40. So we leave a lot of meat on the bone. Somebody gets it for 50 cents on the dollar. So you'll have it 120 days and you'll have, is that about right? 120 days? Yeah. No, no, no less, less, less. We'll less. have it for maximum, we think, 90 days. 90 days, yeah. Okay, so in 90 days, you'll make 40 grand on a $60,000 investment. That's right. That's right. Oh, and that's too, that's too bad. That's following I, all I did, and I, I was the one that did it. So, so I was the one that went back in there and I hired some landscaping people and some paint, painters the inside of the walls just, had a lot of stuff. Right. Just and it, then, it wasn't like painting. It was just, just uh, to make sure let me, it was let me put you Let me put your feet in the fire for a minute, okay? Yes. Would you take 120 today? Yeah. Absolutely. That's your starting price. There you go. Oh. Okay. What all, all someone can do is offer you less, right? They're not going to yeah. offer you more. Okay. okay. All right. Now tell me about the other one because we're running out of time. Okay. The other one, fun place. It's what I would call a vacation mountain house. A nice house. <laughs> uh, it's a two story. And the cool thing about this one is we couldn't see the inside. But after buying it, we got semi lucky. I say semi because these properties, a lot of them stay vacant for a long time but it looks pretty clean on the inside. It looks like you could practically move in. The deck and the stairs, there's a lot of it needs to be rehabbed and refinished. The could use paint, but it looks like a more of a retail sale situation. We're trying a different strategy on this one. Um, just to give you some numbers, the after repair value is actually I met with a agent yesterday, we were going in thinking 140. And she said, if you paint the outside and do all the decking and the stairs, it's probably more in the 160s. If you just do the stairs and the wood and whatnot, it's the 140. And so we bought it for 59. So, Holy Toledo. Yeah, we bought it for 59. It's, and then I told her as well, I said, we're open to three strategies uh, and wanted to get her feel because she's the, the most active agent in the area and she actually lives near the town, which is, is rare. So there's the, just flip it to an investor. There's the fix the decking and the stairs price only, like just do that. And then there's the, you know, let's spend some extra money and, and get more. Um, we're probably going to go for the middle strategy, which is simply get someone to fix because the stairs aren't really safe. Oh. Um, and so we'd rather just, you know, for liability to fix, fix the decking and the stairs and make it safe and paint them and then just sell it. Nice. And uh, she's, so, so uh, she's totally on board with that. So does it sound like 
Your worst case is you'll make 50 grand. Your best case is you'll make 80 grand. Yeah, I would say, but we're going to put some into it. So I'd say we shave off 40 to 70, something like that. Okay, I got it. So 40, 40, 40 to 70. 70 grand. How about that? And how many hours and t how much time do you have in these two properties compared with some fixer uppers you did in the past? Oh, way less. We're talking way less, less than 5% of the time. Yeah. Wow, five percent. A lot of the time, Doug did analyzing, and then on the weekends we would drive. Wow. She would do if you were looking at fixers too. To yeah, we so would do that too. The really, Ted, is the point you're making is a good one. It's this is nothing like flip. This nothing. is basically lipstick on a pig, is the saying. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. If at all, I know as we get more into the business, we'll probably be more comfortable with just not even putting lipstick on the pig and just <laughs> no lipstick or anything. just go ahead and get it done okay all <laughs> right each of you take a minute if you will and summarize the lessons that you'd like to pass on there's so many lessons when you do a deal like this that especially if you came from another business where you say oh my god i got all this time off now which uh, gives you time to think i think time and strategy time are the most important i couldn't teach that years ago but now i, I certainly can because i i see what happens to people that uh, you guys have really thought this thing out thoroughly, but you probably was did so much hands-on before. You you just go home with those fingernails that are popping off and the sweat coming down your brow and the dirty clothes. And the people at Home Depot are nice, but getting that stuff in your car is tough, isn't it? It's a <laughs> yep. big problem. I yes. have trucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's forever. So so give some advice to, to my people because they sure appreciate that. I've got two minutes left, so if you each take about a minute, that would be great. So I really like the your strategy. That's really what motivated me to, you know, tell Doug, let's do this because the buy low, sell low strategy is just, you avoid all the headaches. You avoid a, a lot of the things that could go wrong with the flip. And you basically are flipping the papers, basically what you're doing. It, it definitely is a strategy and doesn't take as much time as doing the flip. Yeah, I would Good. add that Thank you. this is probably one of the lowest risk businesses that you can do in real estate, and real estate is a great business. The downside of real estate is you can expose yourself to a lot of risk. If you do it right and do, this is a business that if you do, you're in and out. The only risk is if you overbid, and if you're disciplined, you won't overbid. So that's the lesson. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I got to tell you, the two of you are terrific. Uh, you're a hell of a team. I don't want to compete with you. At, I don't want to compete with you at auctions because I see you're both looking at it a little bit differently. One's got the engineering approach and the other's got the uh, hands-on fixer-upper approach. Uh, you, <laughs> you guys are going to be hard to compete with, but congratulations. I'm glad you're doing so well. I really do want to know when, when you get this, those two deals buttoned up, because it sounds like you're going to have a two-week selling period and you're going to be uh, off to uh, auctions again. You're going to be flushed with cash and feeling <laughs> yep. good. And what's better than being flushed with cash and feeling good, right? It's, uh, it's a <laughs> wonderful <laughs> feeling. Nothing wrong yeah. with that. Oh, my goodness. After going through that picture, listen, I've done it many times, and I certainly don't recommend it. You guys are terrific. You just did a great job on this podcast. This is the longest podcast uh, I've ever done with an interview, and you guys were absolutely A1 terrific, and I want to thank you both. Thank Thanks, you. Ted. Thank Thanks you. for everything, Ted. Really. All right. Hi, listeners. Did you like this week's episode? Don't forget to leave us a rating and a review to let us know. 